Today's Food Friday Hunt Harvest Health podcast is brought to you by the Stealthy Dehydration and Canning Guide. Ryan and I have been working on this ebook for a number of months, and truthfully, we've been working on it for probably the last 20 years in just teaching ourselves food preservation, such as dehydration, canning, freezing, and just a number of ways to utilize all of the wonderful foods that we get from our property. We also have in there some foods that we wild harvest, such as mushrooms, and I decided to add a whole lot of extra work for myself, but it's going to really benefit you and getting you um, acquainted with some of the foods that we use in our recipes, actually all of the foods that we use in our recipes. I created a healing foods library, and what I did was I broke down Uh, all the foods that we have in the recipes. And I talked a little bit about them, maybe uh, what they are, like the qualities of the plant, and then how they're grown, uh, maybe what the climate, and then what are their healing or medicinal qualities. Now, I don't have all of the foods that we grow in the Stealthy Garden in the Healing Foods Library. The foods that are in the recipes in this guide are what's in the library because um, I'm going to keep adding to that library, um, but we don't dehydrate or can all of the food that we have in our garden. And so the Healing Food Library is not 100% comprehensive of of our garden, but it is of the foods that you'll find in these recipes. This is very exciting for us. This is our first book. Our goal and our why is to get um, you as well as your children and your grandchildren to understand the healing benefits of food and how it influences many generations to come. So hope you enjoy it. Enjoy this podcast today where we do talk about canning and dehydration. You can find the show notes for this podcast at huntharvesthealth.com slash podcast slash food preservation. Howdy folks, welcome back to the Hunt Harvest Health podcast. What I thought we would do today for today's podcast was we're going to talk a little bit about what we're doing this time of year. We're going to talk about some dehydration, um, things that we're up to, and talk about a little bit of canning. Um, It's harvest season. We are full swing. This is probably a podcast that we should have had knocked out about a month ago. But mm-hmm. we're a little late to the party. We've been uh, just so tied up with everything and um, <laughs> quickly realized it's kind of hard to uh, get content out and do the processing and the canning and the, all the food prep that and we're And not doing. have a kitchen that worked for a while. We just got our, yeah, literally today, got trim put in our kitchen. So we, we're getting a functional kitchen again. And Yeah, washing dishes and running back and forth to the bathroom like uh to the, <laughs> not to, to go the, to the bathroom but to do dishes. no doing dishes in the bathtub is not the best thing to do when you're when you're canning um you really need good access to the sink and yeah. washing things and uh, it's, yeah it's we don't struggle. live in a big mansion with two kitchens or i don't know what do people have that have fancy nah. stuff they have more than one kitchen sink we live in a pretty <laughs> modest house and uh you wouldn't think it's much but I got some exercise running from the kitchen where I'm, you know, I've got my pressure canner going back and forth to where the water is because we had no sink, no anything. It's just a struggle. No dishwasher. Crouching over the bathtub doing dishes. It's been just a blast. But, um, yeah, this is a podcast we probably should have done a while back. I know we're getting to that point of the year where, uh, you know, a lot of people's gardens are kind of winding down which mine is for sure, but I still got a lot of stuff popping out there and and we're still able to harvest a lot of, a lot of foods. Um, we still got that dehydrator, you know, cranking out a ton of food. So, and then also, you know, we're bringing in meat this time of year. Um, I've had, uh, you know, several, several animals so far this year, um, a bear, actually a couple bears and then, uh, you know, a deer and an elk. So, you know, meat's coming in, and uh, there's a lot of things that we like to do with it um, other than just, you know, bring it to a butcher and drop it off and have them do it. So um, I kind of 
find yeah. it pretty rewarding doing it myself and and i know my meat's coming back to me and um i know that uh you know every step has been taken to make that meat taste as good as it ha as it can be so um yeah there's, there's, there's just a lot to it it is really time consuming so it's not easy we're not going to fool anybody by saying doing all this stuff yourself is easy because it is not and it definitely sucks up a lot of your time but uh it is pretty rewarding at the end of the season when you have everything you know in your pantry and you kind of kick the door open and look at it um, and see what you've done <laughs> that it's middle awesome. pantry we have all the so we have so much stuff this year the uh, the middle pantry in our hallway, we turned into, we put all the pickled stuff in there. Yeah. And halfway, it's right but below the, it's not kind of by the stairs. Have you walked up the, the stairway? Like halfway up the stairs, it smells like pickles. And That's I perfect. was like, why does it smell like pickles up here? Because we're not even pickling. And sometimes when he's canning pickling, the whole house stinks like vinegar for a while. But I realized it's that that closet's venting up right and it's going right up the staircase so you get a nice whiff of uh spicy pickles every time you walk up the stairs <laughs> or down the stairs in the morning when i wake up and i come down the stairs and it's like whoa some yeah, pickles. i've got a cruddy sniffer so i'm not fortunate to be able to smell that <laughs> well the thing about Lucky this you. whole thing this whole ordeal of food preservation is that you have to like food. You have to really care about where your food comes from, I think, and where your food's going. Yeah, I think uh, we probably wanted to go with one of our methods of uh, preservation. And I think the first one to start with is dehydration. Um, dehydration is just something we've kind of fallen in love with. We, uh, we do it a lot with everything. There's you know, obviously, you know, we do a lot of jerky and, you know, we do a lot with the meat. But as far as everything in the garden, pretty much everything is, get, is getting thrown into our Excalibur dehydrator uh, these days. Everything from, you know, we make a lot of tomato chips or, you know, sun-dried tomatoes, if you want to call them that. We also make, you know, a lot of chips with, you know, sweet onions and, uh, you know, a lot of powders everything from kale powders beet green powders you know everything green collards you name it and then uh you know we make a lot of berries dried berries we make powders out of that so um that's kind of what we enjoy doing and we run those excaliburs i mean a lot they uh they're always cooking so yeah, we we were fortunate enough to uh ha we've had one dehydrator for quite a while and then we were fortunate enough to get uh, two dehydrators. And so we have those running in the garage pretty much consistently um, while we're, we're doing up all these foods. <clears throat> and what I love about dehydration is that it's so simple. It really only requires the preparation of the food prior to laying it on the trays. It does get a little more complicated, right, when you're doing your backcountry meals and you have to actually make a full meal and right. then lay it on the tray. But even from that point, it's just so simple um, as compared to some of the other preservation methods that do take some education and time. It can take all day. I mean, yeah, dehydration, canning. you can leave the house. You know, you can put it in and leave the house if you yeah. need to. Yeah, and we should talk about that, like as far as the, uh, the actual method or the actual um, dehydrator that we're using allows us to do that, which is really nice because, uh, you know, certain dehydrators don't have the option to set a timer um the excalibur that we use it's it's really got everything you need it's got that timer so you can set it for two hours four hours you can set the temperature which is perfect when you're dealing with uh you know vegetables everything from vegetables to meat um, or a meal where you want to crank it up pretty hot uh, but you can dump this thing down to a really low slow dehydration and uh, and then crank it all the way up. I think the new ones are at like 160. I think they go up to about 160. So, which is great. That works uh, works really well when you're doing meats and fishes. And, um, you know the meals that we do for uh, for our hunts. Yeah, it. The two things that I think are the most important are definitely the time, the time, and the temperature. And if you have a dehydrator, like we have one of those older dehydrators, round ones, and there's no time 
timer or temperature on it and you just kind of was there a temperature on it i don't know no. it's like one consistent temperature it's on or off. and then you put it on there and it just kind of runs and then it just runs until you turn it off well the problem is with that and like i experienced this last week i tried some of our hubbard squash i dehydrated it and i didn't i don't think i cut it thin enough so the pieces were thick when you ate them but I also overdid them. So I thought they were thick. So I turned it up too high and I let them go too long. And it, it was easier to do that, I think, in that other dehydrator because you could forget about it and it would just keep running. Yeah. Whereas now you can. And let's face it, we all got busy lives. So if you can, at the end of the day, before you go to sleep, load up the racks and set a timer for four hours, five hours, and not have to wake up, set an alarm and wake up in the middle of the night and come check your stuff. That's pretty nice. It just shuts off on you, and um, and you come pull the racks in the morning, as well as in the morning. You know, if you have time to throw a bunch of kale on there, just set it for two hours, and you know, go to work, mm -hmm. and then and, come back. And you can do some of your like this summer. I did some herbs. I did a lot of herbs in the hot house. If you have a spot that's really hot, gets doesn't maybe get super direct sunlight, has a lot of um, <clears throat> heat in it. The one thing we have here is we do have some humidity, so you can't really there's some things you just it's really hard to dry per se um but we had a pretty hot summer so i would say some things you can dry um if it's warm enough to do that and then of course if it's too warm too you'll scorch everything and you can't put it in direct sun so the nice thing about the dehydrator is it it evens out that it evens that out and it's not putting something in the scorching sun and you know it's got humidity control in it so you know, that's, I think, the nicest thing about investing in an Excalibur or a dehydrator. We use the Excalibur yeah, because it's affordable and that's... it has those gauges on it. Yeah, there's probably a bunch of them out there. I see some fancy digital ones out there now that that uh, probably do real similar. But um, we just kind of like the ones that we've always used and they work really well for us. So, um, but one of my favorites is the powders. Um, yeah. For some reason, I think more people ask about the powders. Um and it's kind of hard to answer because it's so dang simple to do. Um, don't really even think about it. You know, as far as greens go, you know, we just like throwing greens in there. All you got to do is rinse them off and um, toss them in, dry them, throw them in a little Nutribullet, which is something we use a ton of here. Um, it's got a couple different blades on it, and that is just your blender, and it grinds it to a powder. Dump it in a mason jar, and you're good to go. And, um, you know, as far as when you're doing greens, you could pull 40, 50 stocks and get those, like say kale or collards, mm -hmm. get those in the dehydrator. And then um, when you go to powder it, man, you don't you don't end up with uh, maybe a half inch on the bottom of the of the bullet of the cup. So that right there tells you uh, it is ridiculously concentrated. So when you're making a smoothie or a shake or whatever, you're, you know, or pancakes in the morning, you want to throw some of that green powder in there you don't have to put a whole lot in it it uh it really does go a long way so you know when you get you get a few you know quart jars or pints or whatever you're using filled to the brim with uh with green powder you're set for a while so yeah my favorite powder i think this summer is the dill powder you yeah. had a lot of dill this year it kind of it just like reseeded itself all over it, yeah it was uh, crazy because i grew i grew it. some dills specifically but i didn't mean to grow as much as i did because i had a lot of stuff that yeah it just naturally reseeded from last year in one of my boxes and i just let it go wild and um yeah it was like it was way more dill than i needed so we you know obviously used some of it fresh when we made a bunch of pickled stuff, uh, pickled beans and, and whatnot. But we also, you know, so that it didn't go to waste, I just dehydrated it. And uh, it smells so good. When you take that lid off, I just like to stick my face in it and smell it. So it's like, that smells like a million dill pickles. Yeah. <clears throat> it's, it's that, that's by far, it's vibrant green. It's so pretty. Um, and yeah, and if you, there's a ton of it. We'll be eating that for a while. If you live up here in the Pacific Northwest, you probably eat a lot of salmon, eat a lot of yeah. fish. There is probably nothing better than there's a certain way you can make <laughs> fish. And it's not a healthy way, but I'm a big fan. Um, it's what I used to run, you know, when I used to cook my uh, clients' lunches um, when I was guiding. 
and I would use just some mayonnaise and, and dill. Mix a pretty good amount of dill in with the mayonnaise and just, you know, slather that salmon mm-hmm. filet with that. So it leaves a big white coating on there. Sounds horrible, but it is honestly one of the best. We don't eat mayonnaise, but I'll eat fish with mayonnaise on it. Um, and it's really, really good. And I don't think I ever met a client that didn't like it, but uh, that's a great way to use up a lot of dill. Yeah, I totally fish. despise mayonnaise. And when I first saw that recipe, I was like, oh, gross. It is very good. <laughs> yeah, it's good. <laughs> it makes you like dill and mayonnaise. Yeah. And then there's that just when, when you're making the fish jerky and that dill, you know, dehydrating the dill with the fish jerky, it's like yep. the best. It's not one of the best smells, but it's a really, it's it's kind of a smell like bacon to me. It just has that good, good smell. It's like fresh food, but yeah. And, and then I think the other powders that I really like are the berry powders. And we just, Ryan, this year we get so many raspberries because we have multiple raspberry um, areas in our yard. We've moved, we had a huge patch in the back and we moved in 20 years ago and we just kind of moved them around. So we get so many raspberries. It's ridiculous. This year, Ryan just like, what, what do we do with all these raspberries? Because we usually freeze them and we don't even end up eating them all before the next raspberry season comes around. So um, Ryan dehydrated them. Oh my gosh, they're like eating candy. They're so good. And they, you know, raspberry is a little bit sour. It takes out that little bit of that. It gives it a little bit of tang, but makes it more sweet. And then, you know, if you don't like seeds in the raspberries, yeah, and that it was makes the it thing. easier to eat. A lot of people really don't like seeds. You know, we we put a bunch of them in, the, in our smoothies, but I can't get the girls to put that many raspberries. They prefer blueberries simply because there's so many seeds in a raspberry. Well, one quick fix to that is pulverize the seeds. So you have to dehydrate the berries, pulverize everything, and uh, bam, you got no seeds. Everything is a nice, fine powder. As far as powders go, the raspberries pretty cool when you blend it up for most yeah that and blackberries too yeah Um, Yeah. it's really good again in smoothies which is something we eat a heck of a lot more of in the winter we make a lot more smoothies Mm -hmm. i honestly don't do a whole lot in the summer because there's just so much fresh food um, going around you know we got fresh meat coming in we got fresh garden vegetables but in the winter um you know if you want to get your greens really really easy to toss a you know a couple teaspoons of green powder in your smoothie Um, because we don't get a whole lot of fresh vegetables in the winter we get none so uh Mm -hmm. we don't need a whole lot of salads but you do get a really good amount of greens just by using that powder so yeah and a lot of the green powders that you buy or even the red powders that you buy they're kind of expensive and you know they might be freeze-dried which is we won't get into the difference here but or which will make them a little more expensive or they've got herbs and you know exotic things in them but honestly if you read the back of them it's you know all the greens like there's berries in there uh coconut you know you can buy all these things even if you don't grow them you can dehydrate them and then you can make your own powder um and it's pretty cool yeah. i i'm i'm sold on it for sure and and it's a great way to hide stuff from your kids yeah we almost <laughs> need a, a third dehydrator at this point um what's pretty cool when you have kids is uh, I've got Paley now able to go out, you know, pick the kale, wash the kale, load up the trays. She can figure out the settings, set the set the timer, set the temp, and then you know, once it's dry, um, pull it off and, and crunch it down so it's just ready for me to powder, which is really nice. That takes a massive amount of work yeah. away from me, and um, it's pretty cool. She's at that age where she can uh, add a, another chore to her list and. Help well, tonight you guys prep. tonight you guys sliced apples and pears, and she was running them in and out to the dehydrator, and yeah. those are the best, the pears. <laughs> we have pear tree, and it's made some awesome pears this year, for sure. Yeah, we're at that time, you know, all the apples are popping out there and the pears, and, um, and of course, us, we're going out hunting, so it's a great time to, you know, make up a bunch of apples and dehydrate pears and banana chips and all that kind of stuff um, plums everything that i like to take into the backcountry or just on a hunt or just even driving for snacks um, 
real easy to do and toss them in a bag or a mason jar and, and take them with you when you're driving it's great and yeah we kind of ripped the last of our pears off the pear tree and just got them all done up and we got a lot this year mm-hmm. we got a lot of bags so yeah yeah they're pretty good i've even had peely's tutor and can can i buy you pears and have you dehydrate them for me because the kids literally fight over those paired snacks you put in Tana's lunch, you know, they're just so good. And, and, uh, so I think that dehydration, the one thing dehydration does do is it concentrates the sugars, right? So it's pulling yeah. the water out and it's concentrating the sugars. So yeah. One you, thing about pears is I'm not a big pear fan. I mean, you'll never see me just eating a pear, but when you <laughs> sloppy dehyd- pear in your beer, <laughs> when you dehydrate it, it's, it's on a different level. It's good. Yeah, well, it concentrates those sugars. So I guess there is a fine line with dehydrated food of how much dehydrated food you probably want to eat, like in one setting, because you are yeah. getting more sugar, um, even in vegetables or something. You know, it's con- it's pulling the waters out and it's giving you more of the concentrated nutrients and sugars. So with fruit, you probably don't want to eat a ton of dehydrated fruit. It would be like eating dried fruit all day long. It's probably not good. Yeah, but and, and honestly, what what I do with it is. I'll take some, you know, for the trips and I just, I just do little bags. I mean, just like half a Ziploc bag, but I'm vacuum packing Mm -hmm. it and that's going in my pack and I just have one a day and I usually have it after my dinner and that's just kind of the treat I look forward to at the end of the day. That's my dessert and, uh, it's usually pears. I kick out the apples. They're not nearly as good, but those (laughs) pears are good. Now we do have, we do, we have made some leathers and I know we've gotten questions about that kind of stuff and Honestly, I don't find us. We don't really make a lot of leathers. I've tried a couple of leathers. I tried a chocolate one, which was really good. Um, but I don't know. I kind of just prefer putting the whole f- fruit on there and just making it and eating it that way. Yeah. Because when you make a leather, it's like you have to take the ingredients and you have to blend it. You have to spread it on parchment paper. You have to make sure it's done just right. Sometimes you have to turn it. Um, it's a lot more work. Yeah, I don't. And, I don't really see the point in making a leather when you can just dehydrate yeah. the, the fruit itself. And I eat almost it. feel like you probably eat more sugar when you eat a leather because the leather is thin, and you just like chomp down on this this whole thing of leather. Well, That's a lot of fruit on one tray. But this is one thing that is good, and it is worth the work. And that's um sweet potatoes, sweet potato leather, or you know you can make them into chips if you just dehydrate them a little more. Um, I had a massive amount of bell peppers this year so one of the easiest recipes and we'll have this in our book um you know it's the uh all i do is i just you know throw some sweet potatoes in the oven cook them down get them get them nice and soft and i just pulverize some of the green bell peppers and um you know i i take that i put it in a bowl um you know blend it up in the bullet and then I take that, it's like a paste, and I spread that out on parchment paper on the dehydrator, and you can do it really thick. I mean, you know, an eighth to a quarter inch or so thickness, and, you know, the thicker you get, you can make it into a chewy, you know, leathery sweet potato, or you can just make chips and, um, you know, put it on pretty thin and then just kind of break them to pieces. And, man, that is, it sounds, maybe it doesn't sound that appealing, but it's uh, it's really good. It's got a really good flavor to it. That's one of the things that uh, that I'll actually take the time and make go through the motions and uh, you know take all those steps and make an actual yeah. leather. Unfortunately, we cannot grow sweet potatoes. <laughs> it's the one thing that we yeah. cannot grow here, uh, and I wish we could because they're so good. I would prefer to eat sweet potatoes over you know even the potatoes that we grow, but we just can't grow them. So we do have to buy sweet potatoes to make that to make that recipe. Honestly, we don't buy a lot of the foods that we make. We, we're harvesting them out of our garden, but there are a few things we can't do. Coconut, can't buy coconuts, can't buy sweet. I mean, we can't grow coconuts. We can't grow sweet potatoes, uh, but that's okay. I mean, I think most of you out there probably don't have big gardens like we do and hot houses full of tomatoes and all this stuff. So you're going to be buying maybe this stuff at the store. Um, of well, course, a lot of people have gardens. I no, I know a lot, a lot of, people of people do. I watch people on Instagram, but yeah. you know, maybe 
maybe not to the level well, that just, we do. Well, you know, you just try to keep it at a minimum. You know, you want to buy as little as possible. Obviously, there's a few things out there like a sweet potato or a coconut that, yeah, we'll break down. We'll buy those. But um, definitely, if I could grow them, I would. We just don't have a long We just season. need a piece of property in Hawaii now. We could grow <laughs> avocados and we could live there half the year. We could live here half the year. Right? You could hunt axis deer and then you could, Okay, yeah. Then yeah, you could we do need a hunt piece mule deer. Hawaii, actually. Yeah, we do. We to chase those axis deer. <laughs> I got so close to going on that trip last year. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I really like Hawaii, but it is kind of far away from every, everything. Um, but, wow, it's just so... The climate for growing stuff is pretty amazing. Oh, you could just roam oh around gosh. eating fruit. Oh, trees, yeah. Walk my, around. I have friends who live there. And Ryan went pig hunting in Hawaii when we were there with a local. Didn't get any pigs, but he came say, home with. I wouldn't say we went pig hunting. We went walking through the woods. Yeah. Um, I didn't even have a weapon. Um, <laughs> he was going to. We walked through the woods on. for, I don't know, a couple hours. And really all we did was go from, like, we were picking oranges and picking every single thing you can imagine there's just fruit everywhere so yeah he fun. came home with no pig and a whole bag full of fruit and he's <laughs> like no wonder these pigs are so huge they just eating just this fruit. fruit all day long and so yeah. yeah hawaii is like the perfect climate for growing yeah. growing stuff but yeah no sweet potatoes but that is one of our favorite things to make um i think the equipment also for dehydration is super simple. You need a dehydrator. You can't really get around that unless you have the perfect climate and you can dry things, you know, yeah. with plain air out there. But a dehydrator is essential. And then you need some parchment paper maybe for some of your recipes. Um, yeah, if you're making meals, something that's wet or like a chili, um, spaghetti, something saucy. Yeah, you definitely need some parchment paper. I think the one expense is other than the dehydrator, is uh, something we we uh, broke down and got, and that is a slicer. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that thing is incredible. It makes your life so easy when you can just, you can grind up 20 pears in minutes and, mm -hmm. and just go through them like crazy. If you're having to individually slice through all those pears with a really sharp knife, it's going to take you a long time. And they're never going to be uniform. So the dehydration yeah. time is going to vary. You're going to have to pluck some of the slices off and let some of them stay on. So when you have the ability to have like perfect slices, it's just, and, and with jerky as well. Mm -hmm. We use the crud out of that thing for jerky. It just makes everything uniform and super quick and easy. So yeah. And is there is a little expense there though. The high, yeah. um, you know, they're, they're, they're a little bit spendy, but in the long run, I, I plan on having this thing forever. So Gonna, How much is a packet a of jerky at the store? They're not cheap. Like good healthy jerky, I feel, is like five bucks a bag, right? Oh, or yeah. Or six, seven bucks a bag. For and, healthy jerky, yeah. Mm. Say for a good clean meat um, without all the junk and yeah. stuff. Yeah, you're probably spending a pretty penny to get some of that. Yeah. I think I think the upfront cost can be a little intimidating when you start. You know, if you're – some people aren't – challenged by that we've just collected things over the years right we we had a dehydrator and then we were fortunate enough to have somebody give us a second dehydrator um and as a gift and you know and we ryan's bought a slicer he's bought the meat grinder you know over the years it wasn't like we bought them all at once we were doing a lot of stuff by like old school ways for a long time but now you just kind of grow it and then you get a slicer and you're like, why did I not buy a slicer like 20 years ago? This is amazing, you know? Yeah. Um, so there are some of those things. But then you're looking at like maybe you need a vacuum packer. We have a small um, food saver. Yeah, but I never use it. For like it. apples or pears <laughs> maybe in the back country or if you're going to vacuum pack your dehydrated meals. Yeah. For, for weight Well, issues. we're spoiled rotten because with my business, we have a big commercial vacuum packer. So um, oh, yeah. I can crank out, you know, let's see, 12 bags at a time if I want. But, yeah, we also do have just a household um, little backpack thing that I use Food sometimes. Food saver. Yeah, it's not, not as much. But. Yeah, that are like uh, Ziploc bags or we just use mason jars with lids on them. So yeah. we store most of our dehydrated single foods and mixes, powders. 
they're all in mason jars with lids yeah like in the say cabinet. you know like if you do a bunch of mushrooms um mm -hmm. you know if you're doing some oh cauliflower mushrooms or oysters or you know there's a variety morels are really good um, dehydrated um you kind of have to pick and choose which ones work and which ones don't. Uh, those work well in just a jar, you know, with a lid on it mm -hmm. and a minimum amount, minimal amount of air. And then also we do a lot of sun-dried tomatoes and uh, mm -hmm. whatnot. Those are something <laughs> that we just toss in the We jars. try to, like, get them in the jar, but they're so good that when you start eating them yeah. right out of the dehydrator, you just can't stop. Yeah. And then kind of speaking about the mushrooms, too, is, you know, we have... I think my favorite mushroom is probably the chanterelle. This time of year, it's chanterelle season, and so we will be going out more mushroom hunting and, and yeah, collecting them. Yeah, it's been a them. really bad it's been hot run this so far, but it's we're going to get it here shortly. It's, yeah. um just didn't have any moisture all summer long, so we've had some rains of late, but um, yeah, yeah, just getting that moisture. But when we get them, we usually hit jackpots, and we come on with so many of them that we can't even really eat them all in a week. You know, we um, so we dehydrate them. I don't know if chanterelles are my favorite dehydrated though. No. They don't rehydrate very well. You really have to cook them in like a soup or stew. You know, they're they're hard. It's easier for morel. I I feel like to hydrate a morel. Yeah, I but, never I never am a huge fan of dehydrated chanterelles. Um, you know, I know there's a lot of different ways, and I've tried them all, um, cooking them down and um, backpacking them and, and all that. But they they always tend to be a little rubbery after you rehydrate them or when you go to cook them again. So I think chanterelles are best fresh. Morels, on the other hand, you can get those rehydrated really, really well. Mm -hmm. They have a get, great flavor after the fact. Um, a lot of the coral mushrooms, cauliflower mushrooms, oysters, uh, those are those are all really good dehydrated as well. Had really good luck with those. Yeah, that's uh, funny. We call we call mushrooms in general. We call them fairy food uh, mainly because we have gone hiking in an area by our house since our older daughter was little. Haley was little. Since Haley was little, um, we call them the fairy woods, and we go there and we hike around and uh, fairy hunt. Yep. Yeah. Um, Bailey's, Bailey's, find chanterelles. We go in and, you know, Pacific Northwest again, it's moss covered old growth. And uh, kind of where we find the chanterelles up in those ferns, it just kind of looks like fairy woods. And Paley's always mm -hmm. had all these ideas of, you know, she finds these little, uh, these little cones and they look like sleeping. We've always called them sleeping bags for yeah. fairy. So yeah, she, uh, she started that off, so it's always going to the fairy woods when we go chanterelle hunting. Mm -hmm. So the chanterelles are like little golden nuggets out there. So we call them fairy food. Uh, it's it's kind of sweet. Nothing like a fresh chanterelle, though. Mushrooms are really fresh. That's that's the way to go. And dehydration is for when you just can't eat them and you need to keep them because they're too precious to not to let them spoil. You yeah, know? And I think the best combo food or to com what, what you should combo chanterelles with is elk. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's elk season. Usually yeah. you get fresh elk coming in and you're, you have the ability to pick a bunch of chanterelles to go with it. That's uh man, that's good. That's like a match made in heaven. Yeah. And then we eat our morels in the spring with a uh, bear Yeah, and the morels are really good. They're super meaty and, and, uh, I love the morels too, but the chanterelles just have that buttery beauty, beauty to them. But, um, Buttery yeah, beauty. Buttery, buttery beauty. beauty. <laughs> I never, yeah, I never thought of them like buttery beauty. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I probably I've just taken so many pictures of chanterelles. It's like uh, cooking chanterelles. Anyways, so I think uh, I I definitely know that dehydration is not hard to do. And even if you just want to get one thing like pick one of your foods that you like and start with that dehydrate that and see how it is you know a lot of people start with banana chips yeah um they good one. they you know because you can buy a bunch of bananas at once right so you can do at least a few trays of banana chips and try it out and i think they're excellent you know i like them as well they're a little sweet but you know start with something like that and see if you like it and then, you know, move up to maybe making your meals and doing your dehydrated backcountry stuff like Ryan does. But 
Well, yeah, Even there's that's no, pretty there's, simple. there's not like there's this big learning curve with the hydrating. It's really, really simple. The making of the meals, obviously, like spaghetti sauce and dishes that you enjoy, um, <clears throat> curry dishes or chilies, stews, you name it. Um, you that's you know that's the hardest part. The actual just fanning it out on some parchment paper and setting a dial is really easy. Anybody could do it. It's super simple. It's not. It shouldn't be intimidating at all. And it really does allow you to, you know, jack up your, your game as far as food goes in the mountains if you're a hunter. Uh, that is, uh, that's helped me a ton. It's helping a lot of people, I think, uh, you know, they get to pick out what meal they want to eat instead of having to go stand at the uh, REI and look at what Mountain House is serving or Backpackers Pantry or all the others. Um, yeah, it's definitely a, a great way to go. I think a lot of people are catching on to it, and finding out that it's super, super easy. Well, we we use it every day in our house right now. This time of year, it's I, I have complained to Ryan once in a while that I wish we were just a normal family that went on vacations. Like we go to the lake and we go jet skiing and we don't have, we literally have, you know, we have a small piece of property, but we have like a farm. We have chickens we have that have to be taken care of. We have a garden that this summer you couldn't leave it. It was too hot. Uh, and then when the food starts coming out, it is literally constant food harvesting and doing something with it. You, you can't like Ryan can leave and go hunting, but if somebody's not here or if I need to leave for a week and go somewhere, like somebody has to be here. Um, and it's this time of year you would think, Oh, well, yeah, the dog and the cat and all that. It's, it's the garden. You cannot leave the garden because you're gone a couple of days. There will be so much food when you get back um, or it'll be burnt or, you know, so it, it's sometimes this whole idea of having this lifestyle. It's awesome. We're used to it. It's our life. Unfortunately, we're not super uh, social. I would like to be more social than we yeah. are. Uh, I've you always complained have, about that. You can have the, the but jet ski and the lake and all that. Just, just you know what I mean? Like just go food. on a vacation somewhere <laughs> where we're not thinking about, oh, is the garden watered? And you know, oh, I, yeah. I think about that people that have like small farms, you know, these small farmers, organic farmers, like yeah. they, they can, that is a 365 day of your job. Like no, well, maybe the winter. So the winter, you, you you're not lose, doing it. You but. can lose 12 hours in a day so fast if you're canning. Um, yeah. You know, every batch of spaghetti sauce, you, you know, there's another who knows how many minutes it, it truly takes. We should time that sometime. But to say if you're canning meat, you know, there's 90 minutes right there if you're doing cold yeah. jars of just actual canning time sitting on the in the canner so well not even just the canning think about it's the prep work the, the harvesting okay if, if ryan's gonna do elk meat what does that entail that entails ryan preparing for an elk hunt that has ryan driving to his place that has ryan hiking dozens and dozens of miles that means if he's lucky enough to succeed at getting an animal he's now packing it out you know this last elk was days of packing out he gets home and then it's days of cleaning meat, prepping meat, and then after that, and, and vacuum packing and hamburger. I came home one night to like a hamburger explosion in my kitchen because he had the grinder out. It's just like, it's craziness. And then, and then after that, you're going to can it, possibly. I mean, it is like, we're talking, it could be weeks of solid work like you have no job well it you is just definitely. sit here and you do meat and that's not including your vegetables that's not including your spices that's not including your fruits so it is um for us it's become really a labor of love and it's part of our lifestyle and and now we couldn't imagine like what would it be like to have to be go to the store i still go to the store and buy stuff you know this time of year i buy spinach and i do that we don't grow that you know it's but I rarely buy vegetables. I rarely buy fruit. Um, and even now we're getting to the point in the winter, we're barely buying that stuff either. Mm -hmm. Right? And so now we love it. And we're used to it. We know yeah, we feel just, better. When I eat out, I feel it's horrible. It's just a lot and, of work. Um, but it is a lot of work. You can't hide the fact that it takes a lot of time to do it. So 
don't so think just that start you can with skate banana slices and, not, and you'll be good like just no, start slow <laughs> no it's the meat the meat processing takes a lot of work if you're doing it by yourself you know there's just a lot of time spent grinding and if you decide to make some sausages or make some different things like that yeah it takes a lot of time mm -hmm. um, you know just grinding it grinding it twice if you're going to add some some clean fat to it or you're going to you know add some spices and um, I this year you know I I I mixed it up. I like to mix it up and try new little spice recipes into the burger and, uh, you know, just flavor it up a little bit in different ways. And then, yeah, I canned a bunch of elk meat as well. So, um, and there again, you can get creative with how you can all the meat. You know, you don't just have to add, or you don't just, you know, have to do it one way, which is, you know, most people just add a little bit of salt and that's it. And then, uh, uh, you know, you can also add, so you can add pepper, you can add, you know, uh, strips of hot peppers, you can make it spicy, you know, mix it up, even with the canning, you, you know, you can add, you don't just have to add salt, you can also do different things, you could add like a lemon pepper or some garlic or onion uh, powder, or, you know, you can um, dice up a bunch of green peppers and have that in there, and, you know, kind of make a... Uh, almost a gravy like uh, dish with it and just have it kind of stewing in the jar there's all kinds of different things you can do when you're canning meat so it doesn't have to be just one way and um, you know it is nice to have a little variety and so I try to get a lot of variety in the steaks that I cut um, and then different ways to do a burger a little bit of sausage and yeah the canning and so yeah it takes up a lot of time but it's so well worth it in the in the off season when you get to chew that stuff up and you know, pull something new out every once in a while so uh, yeah I enjoy it I really do I, I could never imagine going back to you know what I used to do way back and that's we used to cut the steaks off and then just bring it to the butcher and have them grind a burger and uh, I don't know I always had this little yeah something I didn't like about doing that whether it was because I wasn't positive I was getting my own meat back or I just wasn't sure that they were going to take care of it like I would when I do it myself, I know exactly what's in it and uh, how it's been handled. So yeah, we we have saved a lot of money too over the years just doing it ourselves. It's yeah, the absolutely. time, right? A lot of people, it's the trade off with your with what's your trade off for time versus money, right? For us, Ryan enjoys that time. <laughs> a lot of people don't. They don't want to do it. Uh, I would say. I, it's not that I don't enjoy it. It's just that, you know, Ryan really, that's his thing, you know. Like, I'd love to tell the story of when I, I had this job where I traveled a lot. and I'd be on the East Coast or something at a dinner on a Friday night with business clients. And I'd get a text from him and it'd just be a picture of, like, 20 jars of canned potatoes. <laughs> I'd be like, honey, you need to get a life. Like, this is a Friday night. You're at home canning potatoes. And... He loves it. You know, that's, it's like a meditation for him. Um, probably like solo hunting, you know, he enjoys the challenge and he's very patient with it. You know, it does take time, especially the canning, which we'll probably get into next year is, is, uh, yeah, that should. takes a whole lot more patience. Yeah. Let's get into the canning. Let's um, do it. Let's talk about the equipment first. Maybe I think, uh, you know, there's a little bit more involved with the canning, um, from, you know, what you're, putting your food into as far as mason jars and sizes and uh, there's definitely some guidelines that you have to follow you really do want to get um, you know uh, uh, either something you can kind of follow exactly as far as times weights um, that you're using with your pressure canner um, if you're in altitude you want to change things up a little bit as far as timing um, there is a lot to it, and uh, to be perfectly safe, you want to follow those guidelines because you do not want to get. Uh, people used to die, you know, back in the day when things were not canned properly. Uh, botulism was a big deal, and uh, mm -hmm. so you know things you just definitely want to avoid. So there's, you know, basically there's two ways of going about canning. You can do a water bath, which is real simple and real effective if you're doing certain type foods. It's something that we do like. Um, you know, say if I'm just making some jelly or jams or um, one of the dishes I make a lot of uh, is uh, 
jalapeno garlic jelly. And that is what I use for meat and canned food, canned meat. And it's really, really good. Um, but I would not want to make all that if I had to actually run it through a pressure canner. It's just a lot more time. So when you water ba- bathe it, it's it's super simple and it's faster. Um, and what what are some of the foods? What's the quality? Is it the, the, the acidic content of these foods that you can yeah. just water bathe versus yeah, having typically the, can? the rule of thumb. Yeah, um, like say spaghetti sauce um, that you add a bunch of things to. Like say uh, if you add a lot of peppers and a lot of you know onions and, and whatnot, um, you got to keep that. Uh, that acidity right so uh, if you do that you may have to add lemon juice to keep the acidity up but i just i do all my spaghetti sauce in a canner um i think that's probably what's recommended i think it's safer um you know in a pressure canner yeah you're pressure cooking it and you know i'll do spaghetti sauce as well um sometimes where i add i have the meat already added into it and anything that's got meat involved you have to pressure can it. You do not want to water bathe it. Um, there are certain things that you don't. Let's say, you know, if you're pickling certain things, um, beets or onions or um, beans or, you know, whatever, um, perfectly okay to just water bathe it. You know, you're putting it in a, a vinegar solution or, a, you know, apple cider uh, solution and the acidity is up and, and you're, you're perfectly safe. And so you can, you can crank out a lot, you know, if you have your, product you only have to put it in a 10 minute water bath it's it's real fast and quick and simple but um yeah i've got i've got a couple different things i've got one big pot that i use for the water bath and then i've got one actual pressure canner that i use for all the sauces and all the meat and um i uh, i've gone to there's a company that that makes them it's the uh the all-american um model and it is probably one of the best canners on the market thing is awesome it's super solid the latches everything the dial uh, the pressure gauge uh, all there's solid. no plastic pieces on this thing right let's put it that way right no plastic. and there's a reason for that you want to tell that story <laughs> 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 why do we have the all-american pressure canner oh uh, yeah sure well back in the back in the day i was here i was home alone doing what I do, just <laughs> hanging out in the kitchen, making His stuff. His favorite thing, to be home alone. Yeah. and um, Yeah, I think Paley was just little, I was, so we I, didn't even hardly have kids. Yeah. See, I, I was, so I was making a bunch of spaghetti sauce. And I had done up, I don't know, like seven quarts, I think, is what I could get in that, that old pressure canner. And, um, you know, one of the things that you really have to pay attention to when you're canning is there's a little pressure valve release valve you got to make sure that that hole is clear where the steam comes out um that's where you put your weight on well apparently um you know with the old canner i couldn't really get a clear view of it and it it obviously was plugged because so i got everything set on there and uh i had eaten i think i was eating spaghetti (laughs) making (laughs) spaghetti sauce eating spaghetti and so I'd eaten it just standing right there by the stove. And this thing is obviously gaining some pressure, gaining some steam. And so I, I walked into the living room and all of a sudden it sounded like I had a jet airplane <laughs> in my kitchen. <laughs> it was like a bomb of steam went off. And um, it depressurized everything inside the canner. So that lent everything to come out through the top. It blew, there's a, there's a safety, um, release little thing, plastic thing. I don't know what you call it on canners in case all else fails, you know, and it doesn't just blow, you know, and send shrapnel everywhere. It, it releases out that, well, that thing blew out. And so I don't know, it's like a half inch hole, maybe a little less. <laughs> and so everything came out, went straight up to the ceiling and <laughs> there was, um, it was raining pink spaghetti sauce in my kitchen everywhere i could not get to my stove to turn it off by one way because it was pouring you know so stuff off the, off the ceiling so i had to go and crawl around the other side and reach my hand up kind of just guessing where the dial was because my whole kitchen was nothing but steam and um and hot water coming off the ceiling and so yeah i turned it off and hung out and waited for it to depressurize a little bit more 
yeah, my whole kitchen was loaded with pink spaghetti sauce, <laughs> top to bottom. So I spent the rest of that night uh, trying to get it off the ceiling and everywhere else. And the worst part is I lost seven cans of spaghetti sauce. Oh, my gosh. Because it takes a long time to make seven cans of spaghetti sauce. It takes yeah, a Yeah, seven day. quarts. That's a, that's a cooking lot. Cooking it down and peeling his yeah. tomatoes. and Yeah, it was a mess. I was pretty good. bummed out about it. So, um, yeah, I just didn't like the design of that thing. And so I uh, I went and got the, the best pressure canner I could. That was at Old American. So it's it's just I've had no issues with it. Real simple, mm -hmm. real strong. Uh, not going to have any any little pieces break on you. So that's yeah. what I've gone to. It's definitely worth it to get to pay a little bit more for that if you're going to be canning a lot. Just safety, <laughs> safety well, alone, and yeah, and you know it's partly my fault because I didn't make sure that that little valve was clear. You right. know, but I couldn't I couldn't see in there. So I don't know. It's one of those deals. It it was a pretty funny. It happened, but. <laughs> all right so we have our all-american pressure cooker oh. what else do we need for canning so there's a few things you know you need some tongs to be able to lift the jars out put them in lift them out mm -hmm. um they have kits out there honestly They're yeah really we we'll put one on our website we have, I have a canning kit on there with jars and yeah I mean, all you that got stuff. like a, a funnel so you can just kind of slop spaghetti sauce in your mason jars and yeah. not get it all over the rim so there's just a few pieces like that your most important is obviously the jars uh, the lids and the bands um, I try to reuse bands a lot so I'll can something and I'll just pop those bands off and reuse them so I don't have to always buy new bands but um, the lids themselves I always run new lids when I'm canning because mm -hmm. uh, you know I don't want any mishaps and I don't want something to not seal right and then me find out about it later when it's in the pantry so yeah and i guess we got to remember that canning originally started because they didn't have refrigeration right they're preserving food um for longer so that, that it didn't have to be refrigerated um and that meant that they they had you have to have that lid seal and that's going to keep microorganisms from growing in there right and yep. so that's that's really important and those lids have to be you know, most of the recipes that i've seen say you just need new lids every time you do it because there could be imperfections and stuff um but yeah you might get you know you can pop those lids off without getting a wrinkle but risk it I just get new lids because um, you'll get little dings and we use mason jars for everything here uh, we, we have more lids of, and bands in this house than anything yeah they are everywhere and they're kind of like markers in my life kids markers i somehow put them back and then they end up all over the place and i find markers everywhere i feel like that is mason jar lids and bands <laughs> like every drawer every place i look there's at least one if not 20 yeah so, i think it's um i think when people come over here they, we're all drinking out of mason jars i think they find it a little weird but we're I, so used to it i don't know just seems normal but i think uh, most people have glasses they drink out of they do and i Crazy. see those glasses when i go shopping you know we just got a new kitchen because our kitchen exploded a few months ago and i you know when you get a new kitchen you kind of want to redo some things and i go shopping for dishes and i see all these beautiful glasses like real glasses and i think to myself oh it'd be cool to have real glasses and then I can just hear Ryan going, why would you buy glasses when we have tons of mason jars? And I'm like, oh, I probably shouldn't buy it. And and then well, I guess I, it's kind of true. You I've know, seen because some pretty uh, sexy blue mason jars that we had a few of those We have some point, sexy. So. You have like four of those left. Yeah. Yeah. You canned some stuff in them, I think, I this did. time. I bought them for a party. We, we had a, you know, we had one of those parties way back whenever that was i think it was july 4th and i yeah. bought a bunch of the blue ones but all fancy yeah but it's it's fine you know we we have a hodgepodge kitchen we have a hodgepodge life we actually have a fairly nice kitchen now it's like we don't know what to do with it <laughs> it's like for us it's a, it's a fancy we've and we're used to doing food prep and when you eat a jar of food so you've canned all this food usually this time of year is when we're low on mason jars right 
we have enough to drink water and stuff out of. But come a, a month from now, come three months from now, come six months mason from now, jars start crawling out we of the have covers. to have entire pantries full yeah. of mason jars because we're, we've been eating that food. Um, and so I think that's another thing to think about when you're doing this type of food prep is thinking about storage. And thinking about where you're going to keep all these foods and if you've got cabinet space for all these foods. And, you know, uh, that's one of our deals. We we have right now a closet and by our front door is full of canned food. That's where we're keeping our canned food. And then we have a cabinet full of powders. And then we have a, another cabinet full of dehydrated, um, you know, tomatoes and onions and all those other things down there. So it does take storage space up and those jars do take up space and you need to have a cool place, you know, where they can sit. And so I think that's another thing to take into consideration, but I've seen most people's kitchens and they're way bigger than ours with like lots of cabinets. So, and huge pantries, big, beautiful pantries. So yeah. I think you'd be able to, That'd be nice. most people could probably find plenty of storage area um, or even out, you know, in the garage. If you live somewhere like we do, it doesn't really freeze here, you know. We probably could have a whole area out in the garage with just food, but but we don't. That's where the dehydrators live, and that's where all the actual you know equipment lives. And then yeah, we like easy access. So, okay, so canning. Let's go over. What are some of the bigger questions we get about canning? You talked about meat, right? Mm -hmm. You talked about canning meat. That's yeah, one big and, question you know, we get. As far as getting real specific, you know, we've got a little ebook coming out. So we'll actually go over the recipes. Exactly. Oh, yeah. The ebook. Probably should talk about that. Yeah. So. Because we could spend all night just going could. over individual recipes right now. We could. Um, yes, we have the stealthy, the stealthy dehydration and canning guide. And. You're probably listening to this podcast right now at the first week of October um, on a Friday because it'll be a food Friday. It's out. So if you're hearing this, you can go to our website at huntharvesthealth.com slash stealthy preservation guide and you can see there what it is. And um, it's almost done. It's kind of like, you know, better late than never, but it's going to be it's pretty big. It's pretty big. Like it's turned into quite a manuscript that we've been working on and it's not like a manuscript, but there's a lot of, um, pictures. There's going to be recipes. There's over 25 recipes. And then just because I love to just add more work to my plate is when I was, we were doing this recipes, it was like, well, wouldn't it be cool to know about what these foods are doing for people? Like what are the medicinal benefits of these foods? Because truthfully, that's really what this comes down to, right? Is having a relationship with the food that you're eating and understanding what it's doing for your body. Um, we know that if we don't eat, we don't, we don't stay alive, right? So what are these healthy foods doing for our bodies and what parts of our bodies are they helping and all that kind of stuff. So I did a um, healing foods library. So all the foods that are in the recipes that we have or that we grow in our garden for these recipes they're in that healing foods library. Unfortunately, I didn't do a healing foods library on every single food in our garden because uh, that this book would not be coming out until next fall because we have a whole lot of other foods that we have in the garden that we don't, you know, we don't dehydrate necessarily or can. We're eating them fresh throughout the season. I, I'm pretty excited about it. It's our first real book yeah, we'll together. Get, we'll get better about being... <laughs> timely with things like this because we are a little bit late you know i know gardens are wrapping up but there's still a lot i mean we're still processing well you stuff, can so. get it and you can use it next year you can sure. you can plan your garden in there there's also the stealthy hunter guide um, um garden map and you can go to our website right now and get that that's on our garden tab i made this little fancy picture pdf of everything we grew in the garden this year and how we grew it you know boxes or whatever and I'll have that included in the guide. And, you know, you could plan for next year. You could plan if you're going to have a little garden. You know, what are you going to grow? And then think about food preservation. What are the foods that you like to eat throughout the year? And when you grow your garden, think about those foods, you know? Yeah, there's um, everybody's got their own tastes. And they kind of know what they want, what they want to put up and, yeah, and all that. But, you know, in the beginning, <clears throat> I think I always grew way too much, like, uh, 
lettuce and carrots, you know, kind of what everybody yeah. thinks of when they think of a garden. But we would never even come close to eating all the carrots that I grew. No, we were pulling carrots the, out of the ground in like Christmas time and stuff, and they, you know, not very yeah, good carrots. But you end up tossing them into chickens. But yeah, and way too much lettuce. So now there's certain foods like onions. I just can't get enough onions and beets. Um, because those two things we pickle and those are they're just awesome in salads and mm -hmm. um, just popping a jar open and, and eating them like they are so there's certain foods that you know you'll over time figure out well i need to grow way more of this and way less of this yeah uh, you, know, you grew I, a ton of kohlrabi this year yeah i did and we have not even i went a little put hog a wild on the kohlrabi. stuff out there yeah yeah so there's some things too like i remember he used to grow a lot of radishes I don't really like radishes. So really the only person who would be eating radishes was him. Yeah. And, and what just, do you do with radishes? You just eat them fresh right there or in a salad. And, and you have all these radishes and they bolt really quick and they don't work. So it's like, yeah, maybe I shouldn't plant so many radishes. You well, know? But I, every year it's the same story. I only eat really eat the radishes when I'm weeding my garden. <laughs> I just eat them while I'm out there. And, uh, and then they're gone and then I plant something else in their spot. But this is one of those things that they grow really fast. And yeah. then I can use, utilize that space for something else a little later because I like to separate, you know, the plantings. So I'll start a, you know, a short, a short row of kohlrabi, you know, and then, you know, two, three, four weeks later, I'll grow another row in a spot that I've left saved or a spot where I've grown something like radishes that we harvested and then I'll utilize that. For, you know, it is nice to not have everything pop at once. So. Mm -hmm. space it out a little bit same thing yeah. with beets beets are really good to do that with yeah and so the the guide is you know you can use it for years to come and we just we just wanted to put something together that kind of i guess a little bit of diary of what we did and everything that's in there we made this summer so well, we've made else. some of these before but we actually made all these recipes this summer and most of them we made without a kitchen sink. So yeah, there is if nothing, we can do that, you can do it. <laughs> there is nothing like super fancy about our recipes. It's just, you know, it's something if anybody wants to try them, um, it's a starting point. Yeah. You, know, you can go and, and I don't get too crazy with recipes as far as pickling products and stuff like that. It's real simple and basic. Um, but it kind of gets people on the right track and, and starting it and thinking about it. They can kind of take it from there, I think. And I love pictures, and I love I love the visual visuality of food, and so there'll be a lot of pictures in there of uh, Is visuality I visuality a word. I don't know, but it should be. It sounds good. <laughs> like I to took almost food? all the pictures that are in this guide. I if if there's pictures in there that I didn't take. Either Ryan took them or, you know, our friend James Sylvester took them or something, you know, of our garden. But most of these pictures I took myself and I've really kind of created, I've, I've, this summer and just having this project, I've kind of got intimately connected with these plants by even more so than we were before is by taking pictures of them and, you know, just creating food out of them and taking pictures of the, the food that we created. And um, I'm finding it. I'm just finding it really rewarding that way. My dream is to have a, my dream would be to have like a coffee table book, you know, because I think photography and, and pictures, they really invoke a sense of emotion that I, I don't know if a lot of people read that much anymore. You know, I think eBooks and stuff like that <clears throat> are easier for time, but you know, a coffee table book with beautiful pictures and stuff that will always kind of bring you into yeah, that place. As we, you know, we're still pretty new at this. As we get more involved, um, as we get more involved and we we get uh, more engaged with what we're doing here on the Harvest Health uh, more platform, we'll do, we'll take better pics. We'll take more pics. We'll probably make more videos. We'll, we'll do more things that, you know, I'm really bad at getting this content because I'm just so used to just going through and doing my business. <laughs> I cannot. You guys are going to be super excited. He finished a blog today that he's been working on for about eight months. And so. Really? Eight months? Oh my gosh. You were working on that. Uh, when, when did we go talk at Joe Roder's place? Uh, April? No, I started it back then and I haven't really looked at it since Exactly. Then. <laughs> so 
it's exciting for me. And not only that, Ryan is a really good writer. If you go back to our blog and you read some of the blogs he wrote back when we started this, he is a very good writer. So I mark disagree. my words, Ryan is going to be writing a book soon. I disagree. And I'm going to be taking all the pictures. And it'll be, you disagree. Yeah. You are an excellent writer. I want everybody who is listening to this, if they go to our website and they read his blogs or they read his upcoming blog on solo hunting, you let us know how good of a reader is. And if he sucks, please let me know it that too. Sucks. But it is amateur hour because I'm not good. I never have been a good writer. No, you're always been a good writer. Down on paper. So that's about it. So we when he used to go to Alaska, not Alaska, but Russia, you know, he would journal. This is back in the nineties when people actually wrote stuff down. I used to get letters in the mail, y'all, like love letters in the mail from Russia. You know, that doesn't happen anymore. There was no, you know, maybe with email and the things that have changed, it's just different. But back then, he used to write journals about his days over there in the steelhead and, you know, being on these rivers and all the wildlife and I would read these stories. It's very visual. Like I could see it. I could feel it. And he has always been, uh, I, and I think it has to do with probably anybody who has spent so much time in nature. You know, it's probably like Renella or, you know, Renella is a great writer, even well, though he's a trained a writer. writer. Renella is a great yeah, writer. Yeah, but he's been writing and he's had practice and he's put his stuff out there yeah. and he's been critiqued and he's been, he probably has mentors and he has all this stuff. You are this in the same category in a way that you, no, maybe not with not writing, but close. you it's have crazy. the experience of being out in nature and that intimate connection with that. Yeah, and that's here's the deal. where My writing comes through and that you're conveying that, that you're conveying that thing in time that a lot of people don't get to experience. So it's not like you're like the best writer in the world, but what you're writing about is something that so few people actually experience. Look, I don't write very much. It is a rare rare thing that i write need to do it more like you said i haven't even done any what was it eight months ago i started and um and yeah and i just finished it and i haven't even looked at it in amongst those uh, eight months so i just don't write very much at so all you'll i notice, always find something else to do yeah so what you're hearing now is is that <laughs> in the book our our first book here the ebook I did most of the writing and I took the pictures. Ryan did most of the recipes and he did most of the actual labor. <laughs> so Ryan is the, the workhorse and I'm the workhorse in the fact that I like bringing the creative stuff together and making it happen. He is the one who actually experiments and learns and researches and does the work. So, you know, we make a fair, we make a good team with that. Um, I, I think he's a good writer because he has these experiences, like I said, that very few people have had. And I feel like when I read it that I can walk into that place and maybe not fully understand it, but I can I can imagine it, you know? And that is the sign of a good writer to me, right? I don't know why so, we're talking about good writers. There are no good writers here, but... So I'm not a good writer? Well, you're the best yeah. writer. You're really good. <laughs> Come on. I would prefer Can you give me some blogs. kudos after I just wrote 100 pages of something? <laughs> oh, no. I'm just saying that Ryan is actually the one who did all the work as far as figuring these things out, and, and I put it into form. So Yeah, I, uh, I'll i take shoveling dirt any day of the week over writing. It's just me. You, you, I love it. You guys would get a good laugh at him of, about getting this done, though. Um, and we've talked about this on the podcast before, where it's kind of like when he wants to do what he's going to do, it's like he's going to do it, which is usually hunting, or I got to go outside and do something. Oh, oh, I got to can tomato sauce today. Do you know how much work it is to actually can tomato sauce? It's quite a bit of work. It's, it's a lot of work. So most people would be like, uh... I'm not going to do that. Well, Ryan would actually rather do that than sit down and finish a blog. Absolutely. So, so, you know, he's going hunting again, which is what he wants to do and he's good at. But I said, listen, you got to get this done for me. And I mean, you should see 
he's writing really good stuff, really good content. And you'll see it when you see it, when it gets out, when I get it out to you. He's got this scowl on his face. Like That's he's horrible. just being tortured. <laughs> and I'm like looking at him going, are you okay? And he's like, what? And then, you know, I can multitask a million things at once. So I'm listening. I'm doing patient treatment plans. I'm writing half the book. And I'm listening to a lecture on neuro something. <laughs> and he just looks up. I can't write while I'm listening to this guy talk. And then I go, geez, okay. I have to put my headphones on. You know, he's very, he focuses on one thing. But... You would think oh, yeah. that you would think that somebody pooped in his a... pisnet picnic basket just trying to get him to finish this blog, you know. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I'm not a multitasker in that way. I can multitask around the kitchen, but you can, you can. No way can I listen to a podcast <laughs> and try to like come up with a half not horrible little short blog. Yeah, well, anyways, he's a great writer. This book that we wrote, we worked on, we both did our equal amounts of work on it. And hopefully you will, you know, buy it. It's not expensive. Um, and I have to say, anybody who's written anything, written a book, you feel like, this should be gold. I should be selling this for $1,000. And then you're like, this is just a little book, you know. It's a, uh, but there was a lot of labor and love that went into that little thing. So if it gives you any like help with what you want to do, it shares a little bit of our lifestyle. Um, it gives you ideas for what to cook up in, in the kitchen and especially you backcountry guys with your backcountry meals. And, uh, that's really what was our goal, right? Just, just help people to, to live simply more simply. Yeah. Um, because you think about the days, I guess simple is probably not the word. We could spend, if you didn't have a job, like in the old days, like homesteaders, you could literally, sp I mean, I think women did this and men did this and your entire day, you know, tribally, we've talked about this. Your whole day is preparing for the next day or for food or for meals and, you know, for winter and all that stuff. So it's not really simple. It's just not quite what the world is today. So, anyways, um, again, you can check that guide out, huntharvesthealth.com slash stealthy preservation guide. And you can email us, Instagram us. You can share your recipes on social media um, and let us know what you think. And Ryan's off in the morning let's wrap this up to go deer I hunting go to sleep. <laughs> i'm getting up at 2 a.m to get on the road all right priorities absolutely okay y'all well thanks for listening in hopefully this has been helpful take care guys hey folks thanks for listening to the hunt harvest health podcast if you enjoyed the podcast please leave us a review on itunes or stitcher Visit our website at huntharvesthealth.com for more podcast stories and recipes. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Hunt Harvest Health. You can also message me at Stay Healthy Hunter, that's S-T-H, and I will be more than happy to answer any questions you might have. Also tag your photos, Hunt Harvest Health, or Get Stealthy, as we enjoy seeing what you guys are doing as well.